ladies and gentlemen thank you for taking the time to be with us today and we welcome you wholeheartedly to this in house council forum and on our eighth webinar in this program which we started only this year my name is prasenjit chakravarti and i am an mna partner in khetans corporate and mna group i would like to extend a very warm welcome to this webinar to every one of you whether you are in our audience in india or around the world in house council program is a new program we started in 2023 following its successful virtual programs in mna over the last two years namely the mna masters and mna academy which have proven to be very popular and have been supported extremely well by our clients and associates it is designed to be a private educational program and discussion forum tailored for in house councils teams in india the program is structured to provide bespoke education not only in substantive laws but also management and other topics of interest to in house councils the forum is private in the sense that uh, the public at large uh, is not invited and participation is only by specific invitation uh, by we issue invitations by email to general counsel chief legal officers and senior in house counsel in clients and close associates of the firm and those invitations are extended to not only those individuals but also members of their respective in house teams we hope through this process to provide uh, continuous legal education to in house teams on matters Uh, of interest to them and their companies the format of today's session is a formal presentation followed by an exchange with you all through a q and a we hope that the session will be interactive and we invite you to ask questions during the webinar as issues arise we've already received a number of audience questions if you have a question please do submit using the uh, facility provided in the webinar portal if you cannot cover all the questions during the webinar don't worry we will respond offline by email after the webinar also please note that a copy of the presentation which will be presented today and the summary notes along with the recording will be sent to you after the webinar as a matter of course now let me introduce you the topic today the subject of today's presentation is uh, protecting your data in 2023 uh when we set out uh, this year's program and set up the topic uh, we did so with the hope and prayer that india's data protection law which has been in gestation for some time now would finally be passed after much ado the law was eventually passed in august this year one can't say christmas has come early but it's always better late than never this topic is immensely important for business community and in house council for several reasons including uh, the following the evolution of big data and data analytics has made data an extremely valuable corporate asset data has become the edifice on which innovation is based international businesses have already been complying with data protection laws like gdpr in other countries for some time now and this new law represents another layer of compliance However today how one preserves stores and processes stakeholder data is much more than just a compliance issue it is also a governance issue data protection is paramount for business as it safeguards customers personal data preserves trusts and ensures compliance with legal regulations mishandling or data breaches can lead to costly legal repercussions reputation damage and customer attrition by prioritizing data protection businesses not only fulfill legal obligations but also foster a secure environment for innovation and maintain competitive advantage and bolster their reputation ultimately enhancing customer loyalty and sustaining their success in today's data driven global marketplace in essence data protection is no longer an isolated legal requirement it has evolved into a strategic imperative for business it underpins the ability to compete innovate and operate in a responsible and sustainable manner in today's data driven world in our survey of in house councils last year for this program 
uh, data protection, data privacy were topics that were clearly of tremendous interest to in-house counsel forum. And I'm sure that this new law definitely will stimulate it interest even further. Now, let me introduce to the speaker for our today's session. Uh, our speaker today is Shupratim Chakraborty, who is a corporate tech and data privacy lawyer, and he works with clients nationally and internationally. He's also very active in tech policy space and often uh, is uh, consulted by the government think tank on uh, data privacy policy issues. Shupratim brings more than a decade and a half of experience, and he is one of the most experienced practitioners in this area of work in the country today. Supratim is advising the who's who of the business world on the data privacy work. Uh, and that data protection and data privacy work is very diverse and substantial. For instance, uh, he has been advising a major listed corporate on developing their uh, data privacy compliance program. Uh, in also an MNC conglomerate uh, where he compared then reviewed and compared the GDPR compliance with the DPDT Act uh, to highlight the key differences. It is indeed very difficult for me to think of a better practitioner and partner to share his knowledge with you on this topic. So without further ado, uh, let me now invite Shuprotim to deliver these presentations. Uh, Shuprotim, over to you. Thank you, Prasenjit. Um, I hope my audio and video, everything is clear and you can see the screen clearly. Yes, sure, Pratim. Please go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll not waste much time. Let's just straight away jump on to um, the presentation. Sorry. Yeah. So I think before we start, one important aspect is the uh, the definitions, okay, which is uh, the key of uh, I would say the key pillars of this particular uh, presentation as we go ahead. The idea is not to throw a book at the audience. The idea is to sort of make it clear that what are the key pillars. Firstly, I think we should understand what is personal data. The reason is that this law and many other laws across the globe, which are in relation to data privacy and protection, uh, are all revolving around personal data only. We have seen a lot of confusion which comes uh, that, you know, uh, uh, some other kind of data, whether that is also uh, involved. For example, if it is fully anonymized, etc., will that be covered under the purview of this law? Uh, the answer is no. The way the law is crafted today, uh, it is all revolving around personal data. But you have to be careful what you categorize as personal data. And therefore, this definition is important. The definition is any data about an individual who is identifiable by or in relation to such data. So as an in-house counsel, when you're looking at any data set, just apply your mind to see, am I able to identify the natural person who, to whom this particular data relates? The second point is data fiduciary, which is uh, internationally called data controller. Um, interestingly, we have chosen some different uh, nomenclature in relation to some of the crit critical pillars of this law. For example, data controller is named as data fiduciary and data principle is internationally known as data subjects. Uh, now, why so? If you are very interested, you can go back and read Justice Sri Krishna report where you know it has been called out that this has been taken from American jurisprudence and the idea was to create a relationship of trust between the data controller and the data subject. So what's the definition of this data controller or data fiduciary as it is known in this particular law? It is any person who alone or in conjunction with another person determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data. Very important to understand these two uh, important points here, purpose and means, okay? Let's take some example. Um, say you have a payroll guy. OK, a payroll entity who's helping your organization and, and you have told them that, listen, first of every month, I have this, uh, you know, 10,000 employees who should be getting salaries and these are the respective amounts, etc. Now, that person, that payroll guy is actually a data processor and you are determining the purpose and means of processing the personal data. So that's a very simpliciter example of, uh, you know, being a data fiduciary and a data processor. 
Let's take some complex examples. For example, a travel agent and an airline. Both are taking your personal data and both are determining the purpose and means of processing personal data. In such a situation, they would be called joint data fiduciary. Now, interestingly, this particular law does not have a concept called out as joint data fiduciary. So it will be up to you to put it out in your contract with a joint data controller or data fiduciary as it is called so that there is no confusion in future and the liability is very clear that what part of the responsibility and liability is being taken over by you and what is being taken over by that other data controller. Next is data processor. From my example, it would have been very clear. Definition is also fairly simple. Any person who processes personal data on behalf of data fiduciary. Now comes data principle or data subject as it is called uh, you know, universally. Definition is fairly simple. It is the individual to whom the personal data relates and where such individual is a child, it would include the parents or lawful guardian of such a child and a person with disability would include her lawful guardian acting on her behalf. What is data processing? Universal definition, you can just think about it very crudely as anything that you do with the data, personal data. Okay, It could be collection of personal data, recording, organizing, structuring, storage, adaptation, everything that is done with personal data, uh, it would be called processing. And therefore, you have to be mindful that whether it is outward looking or inward looking, whether it is your customers, vendors, or it is your employees, you are actually crunching a lot of personal data and qua that you will have to ensure that you are compliant with this law in relation to personal data protection. Um, now, different industries have different kinds of heaviness from personal data perspective. For example, a manufacturing company may be heavy on the employee side of data, um, personal data handling. On, when you look at a B2C arrangement or say portals which are handling a lot of end customer related data, it could be heavy on the end consumer data handling, so on and so forth. So you have to observe and see that which side of uh, you know the personal data handling is heavy for you. Sometimes it may be heavy on both the sides, employee and customers. So accordingly, you will have to plan your data pr pr privacy and protection related program. So what are the top eight things that you need to know in relation to uh, this particular law? The first thing is that it covers digital personal data only. So if you write some personal information in a piece of paper, it ordinarily is not part of the law. But if you scan the document and put it in your computer system, network, etc., then it comes within the fold of the law. Second is no non-personal data coverage. So um, and thankfully, at, at one point in time, the government had thought to also include non-personal data. It has been now removed, it's a, which is a good thing. Uh, probably in future, you would get to see some kind of, uh, you know, elements of non-personal data related aspects in probably the upcoming Digital India Act, uh, which is in the making, which will replace the Information Technology Act, or some guidelines may also be issued. Um, we are hearing these murmurs uh, right now that this could be the future plan in relation to non-personal data. Next is point number three, which is no categorization of personal data into sensitive personal data, normal personal data and critical personal data, etc. Mind you that even today under Indian law, there is a categorization of personal data and sensitive personal data under the Information Technology Act and the rules under that. So this will change. It is also quite unlike international laws like GDPR, etc., where there is a categorization of personal data and special categories of personal data. Point number four, transfer of personal data to other jurisdictions. Now, you would be aware that at one point in time when the journey of this law started about uh, you know six years back, we started with almost like a hard localization concept and then we moved to mirroring of certain kind of data and now we have this law, which is now saying that you can transfer data to any jurisdiction. However, there are two catches. One is that there would be certain negative list jurisdictions which would be called out and there would be embargoes in relation to transacting in data for those um, those entities. Now, many have asked questions that, you know, which could be these these jurisdictions. 
uh, we are all aware of our countries of concern which government is is very concerned about and probably we will get to see uh, some of those jurisdictions uh, finding mention in that negative list however the good part is that probably that negative list will be a very short list of of jurisdictions and countries where there could be embargoes in relation to sharing data the next point in this context is that if there is a stricter law then that will prevail over this general leeway many of uh, you are from uh, you know banking and finance at, uh, and, and similar allied uh, uh, sphere and the question uh, which was raised is what could be that kind of embargo a simple example could be um, payment systems related data the reserve bank of india has said that such data can never leave the country and that embargo or that stricter law will prevail over this general leeway which has been provided under this law that data can freely flow across jurisdictions point number 5 is no specific obligations on data processors it largely everything has been put in the head of the uh, data fiduciary or data controller as it is known in uh, internationally so you have to ensure contractually uh, you have to look at all your data controller data processor related agreements and ensure that you are insulating yourself whether you are a data controller or data processor by the way it is agnostic the only point that i'm trying to make here is that be clear what position that you you are what hat you're wearing are you a data fiduciary who's determining the purpose and means of the of the what has to be done with the data or you are a data processor accordingly you need to craft and curate your agreement point number 6 is handling of children's personal data very very important because i think it's a sea change from what we have in india today uh, what has been mentioned is that parental verifiable parental guidance uh, confirmation consent has to be taken uh, how this verifiable parental consent is to be taken the government is still mulling over it you could see things like ekyc etc being brought up there is also bar on targeted uh, advertisement and tracking and monitoring of children and when you talk about children you know the age of consent or age of a child is pretty high in india which is 18 years uh, as compared to other jurisdictions say like gdpr etc it is pretty high because in gdpr for example it's 16 years it can go below up to 13 years point number 7 data breach reporting there is no materiality or risk based threshold which has been given for personal data breach reporting so in case there's a breach which occurs and i'll show you the definition which is fairly wide then you'll have to report it to the uh, data subject to the users and also to the data protection board finally the there are very very high steep penalties which have been prescribed which can go up to uh, you know indian rupees 250 crore or more which is about 30 million usd or more Uh, and at one point in time the draft had this upper cap of 500 crore uh, rupees uh, people became very happy that you know that upper cap has been removed so therefore probably the upper cap is the first one that you see in this schedule of penalty which is 250 crore or 30 million usd uh, that understanding may not be correct because in a particular scenario you can possibly trigger more than one of these buckets and therefore it could be 250 crore plus 200 plus 200 plus 150 plus 50 much more than 500 crore um another interesting thing is that this particular law is a little balanced i would say because there are certain duties also which has been cast on the data principles or the individuals so for example they cannot uh, you know give you false fake information uh, they cannot be starting Uh, a frivolous litigation uh, grievance process etc if that happens then a penalty can also be levied on them of course the amount is small but uh, nonetheless uh, which is rupees 10000 but nonetheless there is also something against the individual which is making it little more balanced um also you know there is no compensation provision so maybe not so good from an individual perspective but from uh, organization perspective Uh, you may be avoiding a lot of vested litigation for money under this law uh, there is no criminal sanction no imprisonment provision which has been provided under this law which is again a welcome move and this is a conscious effort which we see the government taking in decriminalizing a lot of laws applicability i think uh, next important pillar so when a personal data is being processed within india okay if it is personal data which is collected in digital form i have already told you Uh, and 
it is or it is collected in non digital form but it is digitized later in both these instances it will be covered within the purview of this law the next question is on extra territorial applicability of this law it is also applicable to foreign players when they are trying to provide uh, goods or services to data principles within india okay so thankfully that the second element of gdpr which is you know maybe tracking monitoring of of people within india that is not there but if you are trying to provide goods or services to data principles or individuals in india then it would be covered there are certain exclusions as well for example if you are um, if it is for your individual or personal or domestic purposes for example you create a list of people who are coming for your birthday party uh, in your home laptop or tab that does not form part of this particular law that can be kept outside um the next is if some information is made public by the data principal himself or herself for example if you blog about yourself and you cannot then expect that you know this law will protect uh, so that's outside the purview of the law also if there is any person who is under a legal obligation to put out some information publicly then that will be outside the purview of this law next i think the two next important things which i'll talk about is notice and consent you would all be aware that 20th of september the ministry had a, a digital india dialogue on the uh, digital person data protection act and its implementation and rolling out etc maybe i'll talk about it in the qna part of it but uh, one thing was made very clear that if there are simple things to be done like notice and consent and all that those languages to be changed etc you should not expect a lot of time to be given for those so a request to the in house community would be that these are low hanging fruits you know if you look at your notice crafting or consent and things like those it can try and attend to that right now and see that what changes are required um an interesting point on this slide also is that when gdpr came into effect you must have all received those tons of emails saying that please give us consent so that we can send you marketing etc mailers in future now i think we learned our lesson uh, well from there because say if about 500000 people were sent those kind of mailers not even 50 reverted back uh, to give consent so therefore what happened is this entire database got shrunk into a minuscule uh, number and this was quite a bit of a difficulty for businesses marketing teams etc so what have we told in relation to legacy personal data in this law if consent has been taken prior hand under the present regime of the of law that we have today before this law kicks in fully um we will have to uh, we, we we do not need to take re consent okay but we need to send out notices and what should that notice contain it should have these four items that you see on your screen which are in in arrow marked a form and underlined personal data that is collected that was collected basically in the context of the old data purpose of collection manner of exercising right of withdrawal of consent and right of grievance redressal by the individual and manner of complaining to the data protection board okay and that can be sent in any way you can send it in the in as blast emails as in app notifications etc so when this law comes into play if you have already taken consent under the old regime this is all that you have to do uh, but otherwise also from a notice perspective whatever has to be written this is all that you have to put um, interestingly you have to provide this in english and you have to give an option to the individuals to also access the notice and the consent related uh, 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 notification in uh, english and in any of the eight schedule of indian constitution languages of indian constitution which is about 22 languages now we believe that this could be a little bit of a difficulty for all organizations to follow and have things written in 22 languages but probably uh, you know this is what the government uh, really wants because we we kind of we requested the government a number of times but it did not get struck off so we have to prepare and see whether there are tech measures which are possible and vendors etc which are now coming up we'll have to try and engage them and see that the notice and consent is translated and kept in in the 22 languages apart from english consent so i think consent is a very very important pillar we should spend little time at least on the first top left hand side corner that you see what is written consent has to be specific informed unconditional unambiguous with clear affirmative action and 
limited for specified purpose. Now, the first part of this is almost there in most of the international jurisprudence and, and laws. And many would be aware of it that, okay, I need to have a, a no, no silence is consent, no pre-tick boxes. I need a clear affirmative action for what I'm, you know, taking consent for, etc. But there is a very interesting example in relation to the last part, which is limited for specified purpose. And this says that you have a telemedicine app and you have given consent for processing of your personal data for telemedicine purposes. That's all fine. But if the telemedicine app has taken consent for the entire phone book of yours, that part of the consent is no consent. So in future, you could have dissecting of these aspects by the data protection board probably, and a check being done that whether it is really mapping up to the purpose for which you have taken consent. So one has to be very careful in crafting the purpose aspect of it when you are crafting the consent related request. You have to give an option for withdrawing consent. You have to give details for data protection officer if you are a significant data fiduciary, which I'll come to uh, later, uh, or a similar authorized person who has to respond to the communication from data principal who are trying to exercise their rights. The language related uh, requirement I've already talked about. Um, I'll move on to the next interesting point, which is consent manager. Now, let me give you a little bit of a background. When Justice Sri Krishna was drafting this particular first draft of this particular law, uh, we went across the country and uh, what we saw is basically uh, consent is basically quite futile in a country like India uh, because of such large illiterate population, people speaking varied languages, uh, you know, even the most educated people are not uh, really reading what they are accepting and agreeing to. So various concepts were thought of as to how do we make this more meaningful? And what we saw is that um, probably it's good that we have a, a service provider of sorts, very crudely speaking of sorts in, in between, uh, to whom the individual can state that, listen, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm okay to give my consent for ABC, but I'm not okay to give my consent for XYZ. Okay, and that person in between basically takes care of these asks. Um, how so? What's written in this law is basically this: this consent manager has to be a, uh, you know, that middle person who will help in giving, managing, reviewing, and withdrawing consent. It has to be done through an accessible transparent and interoperable platform and this entity has to be uh, registered with the data protection board coming to the next pillar of this presentation which is other legitimate other grounds of processing now just to keep it very simple consent is only one ground of processing okay there can be many more unfortunately under indian law today it is only consent so when you look at the other grounds of processing internationally, you would find many examples. One of them could be medical emergency, which you see in point number three. If a person is dying, you would not first show that person notice and then take out the consent and say, first sign, then I will take you to the OT uh, for operation, etc. That's not the case. So you have to have that other ground of processing. Now, in the commercial parlance, I think two important things, point number one and point number two is extremely important for in-house counsel. The first one is for specified purpose for which the data principle has voluntarily provided the personal data to the data fiduciary and in respect of which the person has not indicated that the person does not want the usage of that data. Okay, very simple example I think we can pick up. I love the one which was there in the previous bill. You are roaming around in a mall and you go to a restaurant there and say, listen, I want to sit down for my dinner. And they say, sir, all um, tables are full. But uh, once the table is available, I will give you a call. Please give me your phone number. So you give your phone number. Uh, what if that guy then takes out a notice and then takes out a consent form and says the first sign, then only I'll call you when the table is ready. You'll get annoyed, right? So therefore, this particular avenue of for specified purpose is very important. So although there is no notice or consent, you know that the person has given that consent for that purpose. Okay, and it is okay to call that person without taking a specific consent in writing, etc. But if that restaurant person then puts this phone number, gives this phone number to the marketing guy of his organization and say, listen, tomorrow onwards, whatever restaurant offers are there, please start bombarding this person. That would not be permissible. Okay, of course, there are 
ways and means of doing you know such kind of marketing activity say after the person has had his food you get a tab which says that are you satisfied here's your rating can you give some more details can we send out marketing mailers you specifically take consent so you can be very smart about using this avenue and but be careful that it has to be voluntarily given and that the person can say no in a future date the second point is again very employ important which is employment purposes for employment purposes and for safeguarding the employer from loss or liability uh, such as say maintenance of confidentiality of trade secrets or intellectual property etc you can always uh, sort of um, you know utilize that as a ground for processing without taking consent uh, for everything you know cctv camera monitoring could be a very classic example for this uh, so all these now have a separate ground for processing and for all these elements you need not specifically hello can you hear me yes yeah, sure bro we can hear you please oh, sorry. so you know you need not uh, then specifically take consent moving on so what are the rights of data principles you know this law as you can understand that uh, you know gives a lot of rights to uh, the individuals and these are right to uh, access the information about the personal data they can come knocking at your door whether it is your employee or your customer they can say listen what data do you have about me then you have right to correction and erasure right of grievance redressal and right to nominate in case of death or incapacity you will have to provide for these avenues for individuals the next uh, pillar is significant data fiduciary people are quite sort of disturbed about this that do i fall within this category or not etc so this law interestingly creates two categories okay one is normal data fiduciary one is significant data fiduciary which is a normal data controller and a significant data controller and how do you become a significant data fiduciary the thumb rules have been given right now which categories will fall under this categories of in industries will fall under this have not been called out it will be called out in future so what are these so firstly it could be volume and sensitivity of personal data that you're processing the risk of data that that uh, to the rights of data principles that it might be caused potential impact on sovereignty and integrity of india the risk to electoral democracy security of the state public order etc if you become a significant data fiduciary then what has to be done you have to have a data protection officer who is based in india you have to appoint a independent data auditor and you have to undertake data protection impact assessment and also periodic audits this is what i was talking right at the beginning in relation to personal data breach okay if you look at this the definition is fairly wide personal data breach is defined as any unauthorized processing of personal data or accidental disclosure acquisition sharing use alteration destruction of or loss to access to personal data that compromises the confidentiality integrity or availability of personal data if this occurs in like i told you you have to go to the data protection board and also to the individuals in order to notify uh, the breach there are certain exemptions which have been provided under this law i am not going through all of them i think for commercial requirement two or three of them are really very important uh, first one is outsourcing okay in an outsourcing scenario where the processing of foreign individuals data is taking place in india uh, under a contract you get large exemptions minus data security related aspects also if there is a merger or acquisition which is taking place which is approved by court or tribunal or other competent authorities say a scheme of amalgamation etc uh, and the nclt etc in those cases only you will get <coughs> exemption but the difficulty here which you should keep in mind is it is not available to any commercial arrangement of business transfer arrangement on asset plus purchase agreement and all which becomes more difficult in a data scenario because what is happening is that the database is moving from entity a to entity b right and you have to ensure that every every customer and every employee that you are moving their data that you are moving you should ideally have consent so you have to ensure that that consent is is kind of there okay grievance redressal i think it's a tiered approach and it's also a very balanced one an individual mandatorily has to go to that company that organization which is a data controller or data fiduciary as it is called under this law 
and they have to complete the process there or if they have not heard etc then you can go they can go to the data protection board of india after data protection board they can go to the td sat which is a telecom dispute settlement and appellate tribunal within 60 days and then the last one is uh, to the uh, appeal is to the supreme court there are also avenues in relation to mediation and if the matter is very small uh, then a voluntary undertaking can also be taken and matter can be closed out there has been a lot of request from all of you in relation to this differences between our law and gdpr because i can completely understand that many of you may be already gdpr compliant or you are in the journey of being gdpr compliant so therefore you would like to know what are the differences now there are a lot of nuances and differences i have set it out i maybe i'll just speak about few of them in this slide the first one is as you can see i have spoken already about it that there is no categorization of personal data into normal personal data sensitive personal data etc gdpr has that categorization of personal data and special categories of personal data then uh, if you see point number 2 here fresh notice to be issued for legacy personal data that is not that was not the case it was very different under gdpr i already told you the difficulties that was faced around that time third point is transfer of personal data to other to, you know, jurisdictions is freely permissible minus that negative list and if there is a stricter law it's very different under gdpr we are all aware there are adequacy decisions and appropriate safeguard mechanisms which are there sccs bcrs etc next is uh, we need to provide privacy notices and consent request in local indian languages no such uh, requirement there under gdpr uh, also i think maybe i'll just pick up one of them uh, which is uh, you know your age of consent for children which is 18 years which is pretty high and like i told you under gdpr it is 16 years it can go below up to 13 years depending on the member state so with this i think i will um, close the presentation and very happy now to uh, go into the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Shuprati, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was very, very insightful and, uh, you know, super interesting. I'm pretty sure the audience would have enjoyed as much as I did uh, as a MA practitioner listening into a very technical subject. Uh, now, I think let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, plenty of them have poured in. I think uh, let's try to cover as many as we can. The first one is uh, an interesting one. Uh, it basically says, should businesses have separate and distinct reporting processes for data breaches towards informing the computer emergency response team, CERTN, as it is known as, and the data protection board and data principles individuals and what are the difference and commonalities in these reporting requirements okay excellent question i think and and this is a good one because many are uh, kind of having a confusion in relation to data breach reporting uh, let me sort of firstly tell you the thumb rule of difference okay between the two cert in computer emergency response team of india has a six hours data breach reporting requirement for cyber incidents this law is in relation to personal data and therefore personal data breach related reporting has to be done now in many of the cases this could be similar okay when you have a data breach you could have personal data involved and therefore you'll have to do a reporting but again please understand the fundamental difference the cert in is looking for cyber incident related reporting the data protection board would be looking for breach reporting in the context of personal data breaches. However, in reality, in practical life, you could have a situation where most of the cases is the same. Okay, you have a breach and there is personal data involved. Now, how do you handle this? To my mind, you can have a unified protocol which which can be there and have a playbook which is kind of there, pre understood by your ecosystem and the people who would be handling things in a bad day. It is very difficult to you know figure out that who should be handling what especially when the requirement is say of six hours breach reporting how are people doing it right now under the present regime of cert in is like this uh, uh we at least recommend to our clients that if you are quite sure that it is a reportable incident then ensure that you do an interim reporting at least whatever is available to you within that timeline give that 
because people are getting show cause notices if they are not reporting within six hours by chance if you have breached that six hour breach the reporting requirement then ensure that you when you are reporting it you have uh, provided justification for the delay okay and again it cannot be too delayed that has been our request um, now when you talk about the upcoming law which will be the personal data protection act and you have to if there is a breach personal data breach then you have to also report to the data protection board and to the individuals who are impacted in such a situation uh, the timeline has not been sort of called out yet uh, you could again create a protocol that you utilize a similar data set to be populated there uh, when when the rules will come out it would also say what all are the things which are to be mentioned in those reportings uh, and then you can accordingly go ahead and report to the data protection board and also to individuals for individuals data breach reporting you have to be very careful in what you are saying okay uh, you cannot uh, say something which is incorrect or wrong at the same time you cannot uh, say something which is uh, you know uh, incorrect uh, basically not more not less so you have to have that kind of language pre-crafted what we advise our clients is to have a playbook and some of these languages can be pre-crafted and kept handy for you so that in a bad day you need not brainstorm as to what should be written and how it should be written back to you please pc interesting uh, second one this is from uh, Yavar Usmani from Stella Apps. A uh, very pointed question, a rudimentary one. What is the date the DP, DPA becomes effective and applicable? Excellent question. I think we, it took us six years to come here. And when we moved towards the end, we moved really fast. And we can see the clear political will. Uh, we see that um, the way it went ahead and quickly went from you know, Lok Sabha to Rajya Sabha to uh, you know, the presidential ascent and then um, uh, basically getting published in the official gazette now the only thing which is left is in the uh, is the notification in relation to specific provisions when these are to come into effect now interestingly on 20th of september uh, there was a kind of closed door meeting held by the minister many of you would be aware there were some big tech some lawyers and some media folks who were there in that room uh, some interesting takeaways from that particular meeting are as follows one is that the data protection board is supposed to be formed in 30 days uh, realistically maybe you can consider this to be 30 to 60 days uh, draft rules are supposed to be rolled out in 30 to 45 days again realistically you can consider this to be 30 to 60 approximately also there there is a proposal to have staggered rollout of this law now when you call speak about staggered rollout staggering is of two kinds staggering of the first kind is dependent on the type of organization for example if it is a government body or a state organ which is low on digitization that could get the maximum time the second category is of early stage startups and msmes which will get a little more time and the last one is all other entities who are expected to sort of uh, you know be compliant as soon as possible when the notifications come out interestingly the government also the ministry also say that if any particular organization or type of organization thinks that they will take longer time in relation to uh, any particular compliance etc they should immediately write to the government stating very specifically the compliance that they are concerned about why they need more time and what is the exact timeline they would require coming to the second type of staggering which is in relation to the compliance for example it seemed like that the ministry was receptive to the fact that verifiable parental consent in relation to handling of children's personal data will take more time okay so for that they were okay to think of a longer timeline as compared to others so i will pause there you know that's what we perceive today from a timeline perspective right that's that's uh, uh, that's very helpful i think next question shupro is from uh, farida desai mahindra uh, the question is a bit provocating it's saying it's not very practical for any and every breach to be reported is it uh, when you think there will be a notification identifying thresholds yeah, you know, we are really expecting that the government, it's a very good question, by the way, we are really expecting that the government should come out with some kind harm, kind of harm based threshold, etc, like we have in GDPR. Okay, it's a it's a tiered approach. 
uh, completely understand that if every single breach has to go out to the data protection board and to the individuals, which could be quite alarming for, for people, which may not even be that of that stature, which is kind of uh, harming the individual, it, it becomes very difficult. So, you know, my personal thought process on this is there should be definitely some harm based or similar principle which should be called out. We have made some requests to the government. Hopefully, uh, it should be heard. And when the rules come out, they should be, uh, you know, ideally, they should be clarifying on these. Right. So I hope for either that gets answered. I think the next question is from Ruchi Agarwal from Genpact. Uh, how would you define employment purpose under legitimate use? Uh, would any ancillary or indirect usage of the employee data, for example, analytics run to assess employees' mood scores, be included under employment purpose? Very good question. I think we are getting very, very exciting and interesting questions. So, uh, you know, let me tell you, we when the law was getting drafted, we really fought hard to get employment as a ground of processing. And I'll tell you why we did that. When we are doing employee internal employee investigation today, technically speaking, there is no clear leeway under Indian law at present. And when you look at the Information Technology Act and sensitive personal data rules, technically speaking, you have to take a consent from that guy. If the person has stored some sensitive personal data in the system of the company, say a laptop, etc., and the consent has not earlier been taken that you should not be storing this and should not have a expectation of privacy, etc. So many a times in Indian organizations, especially, we find we used to find this very difficult that we are doing an employee in investigation and in a bad day I have to go to the employee and take a sign of that. Listen, I'm going to look into your system. It was almost an impossibility to get a consent. So we needed another ground of processing in order to protect the employer. Now, coming to this very new scenario where you have employment as a ground of processing and you can, without taking consent, look at certain uh, elements of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, employee, employee data. So sometimes when we have these sessions, a question uh, was thrown at one, one of those sessions, which say that, should I stop taking consent from employee altogether? Now, remember, this is a data law there are 20 other employment laws which are there so don't stop taking consent on your employment letter and things like those but if there are situations such as say an employee investigation etc things like those you can always fall back on this new ground of processing this ground is fairly widely drafted, which you, if you see, it said for purposes of employment and it goes on to give examples of how it is to protect the employer, etc. My suggestion would be right now, as this matures in a country like India, take a balanced approach. If it is, say, really for protecting the organization, etc., you have full leeway, you can utilize it without taking consent. But if it is crossing some threshold and trying to be more intrusive into the life and personality of the employee employee you should be a little careful because there could be litigation in future where this could get curbed i right. hope i could throw some light on this no well, I, I think my man you did uh, so next again connected with employees there are a few more questions this is from uh, ariba talib from mot mac uh, so the question is so does it mean all employment purposes fall under legitimate uses example collecting medical documents for sick leaves also consent provision says english or any other language so if you can show throw some light on this yeah so i think the first part of the question i've already answered i think it will evolve over time but mm -hmm. If there are genuine aspects which are pertaining to employer-employee relationship and it is not required under any other law to take a specific written consent of sorts, I think you can utilize this. But please ensure that you don't cross the threshold of getting more intrusive than it is required considering an employer-employee relationship. The second part is that in relation to notice and consent, etc., being provided in English, and an option being provided to the individual to access it in any of the uh, other 22 languages as, as set out in eight schedule of constitution. My recommendation would be that you should prepare um, that at least some of those common languages, which could be, you know, there's say Hindi, et cetera, which could be specifically requested in a particular jurisdiction, you prepare for that. Interestingly, in one of the sessions, someone made an interesting point, and I must mention it here, say that, listen, it is written that I have to give an option to the individual to access it in English or any other language. So I will state in my notice and consent that here is the thing in English and you have an option to come to me 
and it, when you come to me and request for any other language i will then send it for translation i think it's a little risky honestly uh, to wait for that day but at least as a prudent middle of the road approach you can keep it ready in english and some of the more prominent languages in the place in the jurisdiction that you are thinking of as far as at least employer employee aspect is concerned uh, so in a bad day you can quickly sort of pull it out and, and hand it over right that's thank you bro i think the next question is slightly conceptual so maybe you i think you would have covered this but this is from zainab zuveria capital land uh, can you please elaborate on the concept of consent managers and is it mandatory from in house perspective yeah consent manager like i told you see it was a very innovative thought process because uh, consent is broken honestly uh, you know it was thought that are we really is it really meaningful if we keep consent uh, as as a so prominent ground in our uh, ecosystem and therefore it was thought of that probably the consent manager will be a solution for all of this now it is a option or a right available to individuals it is nothing to do with mandatorily to be sort of done or not to be done by an organization they have to keep keep an avenue that they will have to probably interact with the consent manager in order to give the rights to the individual okay this is still a bit at a conceptual stage and the government is mulling as to how exactly to this to be rolled out the thumb rules have been given under the uh, dpdp act i think it would be wise to just wait it out and see how this plays out ultimately and the construct is really called out right uh I think the next question is from Harshita from Swiss Re. Now, this is uh, I think an important question. That can an overarching consent be okay, or do we need to take consent for every purpose? Will mentioning for purpose of reinsurance in the consent be good enough, or does it need to be more granular, such as claim purpose or underwriting the risk or analytics? Uh, question from Harshita from Swiss Re. a good question i think uh, see the again the law is just say, starting to sail off okay so at this juncture uh, i would say that again take a middle of the road approach while it says specific i don't think that they want to be super specific about everything it could be very difficult for businesses and this i'm saying because of my discussions with the ministry with the minister where i could clearly see that the thought process was like this that while it is important to protect the personal data of individuals it is also important to see that innovation entrepreneurship and ease of doing business in india does not suffer so probably somewhere it will be there in the minds of the authorities and regulators and a middle of the road approach could be fine you should not be cowboyish that because the purpose limitation is a very big thing internationally also so you should be kind of ensuring that the purpose is clearly mentioned so that a layman a, a person on the road can understand but you need not go so deep or granular that you know your business is completely suffering because if you are moving 1 inch then you are adding one more purpose there within the main umbrella of the purpose that you mentioned right thanks shri prati hope uh, this one more question from harshit I, I, let me take that up also in case of mncs uh, where there we have dpos in other jurisdiction at global level uh, whether dpo is required to be based out of india yeah so if you are getting categorized as a significant data fiduciary which i told you the thresholds the parameters which are laid out in case that happens it is only then that you need to have a data protection officer based out of india but let me also add that otherwise also you need to have such a person who's listening to the request from the you know users etc that person may not be uh, if you are a normal fiduciary a normal data controller not a significant data fiduciary then you need to have such a person may not be branded as dpo but that person should be taking care of the asks that are coming remember the government is very very particular about grievance redressal and hearing and listening to the users and and addressing to their you know their requests etc if that's not happening you could see a lot of matters escalating uh, and then going to the data protection board where you could have actually nipped it in, in the bud and finished it off at your level because the individual mandatorily has to finish off the process or, or kind of get uh, come to you in relation to any grievance uh they have to come to the to the data controller which is the data fiduciary under this law right i think the the next question uh, super team is about contractual obligations etc 
uh, basically since the fiduciaries are the <coughs> entities responsible for complying with the dp dp act how do they contractually insulate themselves when engaging data processors uh, excellent question pc i think uh, very important to note that there is almost no obligation or liability on the data processor so data controller has to contractually understand and backstop it any any responsibility liability through the agreement most of the indian contracts we see don't call this out very clearly so it is important that you go back and check all the controller processor related arrangements and see that uh, what will work for you who are particular processor if it's a small say i was just giving my example say that data processor who is a payroll guy say it's a very small player and you have some 2 lakh employees whose data is you know by the by getting processed through them a 250 crore uh, you know liability they might not be able to you know fulfill or give you uh, in case there is a breach etc but you will have to cough it up right as a data controller as an organization so what should we do should we have indemnity in a, in a country like india will indemnity be good enough or do you want that guy should be taking in of course you should be doing your due diligence on the guy that guy should be taking some kind of insurance coverage okay there are there are cyber uh, insurance coverages and on the dpdp act there is nothing specific but things will evolve over time but should that guy take adequate insurance coverage should there be any kind of hold back bank guarantee etc etc you have to think about it again uh, horses for courses you have to think that which is that suitable remedy in relation to a particular uh, data processor that you have okay. um, that's that's it from my side pc yeah, I think that's a very, very critical aspect because you know you must mitigate against potential risks. Uh, next question is from uh, Lina Desai from Hindus uh, from Unilever. Uh, will legitimate purpose also cover ex-employees data or pensioners? Um, again, so this avenue is evolving. Okay, um, you could. Uh, stretch possibly the argument to cover these but uh, request would be to watch out how this nice avenue of employment as a ground for processing evolves over time and what all gets covered you know some people have started asking that i i am doing um, a background check on a prospective employee will that be covered now that would be a little risky to my mind because uh, if you look at the way it is written right now uh, you might have to wait and see if it can get such a wide coverage and if not then for that uh, say a employee a person who's not yet an employee it could be so that you have to fall back on consent as a ground but the one the question that has been raised to my mind here it is a little better situation because it's an ex-employee and some employer employee relationship was already there and one can kind of construe that this this can be possibly stretched to to be under this this purview of this ground Right. So I think thanks to Super Team for that. I think we have got a couple of minutes before we end, end towards the uh, poll and conclusion takeaways, etc. I think uh, one very important question, Shupro, I think which which crosses my mind actually, you know, is is what are the key challenges, you know, the in-house counselors are likely to encounter in implementing and operationalizing compliance in our DPDT Act. If you can give three, four, five bullet points on that. Yeah, I think, see, the first thing is, which I'm observing for in-house counsel is whose baby it is. Should IT be called? Should HR be called? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So what we are observing in the Indian context is uh, probably the IT and the legal team have to take some kind of a leadership role. If you have a privacy team, nothing like it, et cetera. And try and choose privacy champions from each of your, of, you know, verticals that you have, okay? What that will help is at least be a conduit between the central team, which is handling the program and basically the particular organ of your organization. We have seen usually that works very well. Now, from our overall operationalizing pers pers perspective, I would say here are the three pillars which can make it. I'll just sort of squeeze it to that to make it the answer a little more condensed and easy to understand. There are three phases. Okay. The first one is training and sensitization. If your person to the last person on the floor is not educated enough in this space, this program can never be a success. But one size does not fit all. You can have possibly a 45 minute session for your board members, a one to two hour session for your mid management who will oversee the privacy program and a half day workshop for the people who would actually be dotting the I's and crossing the T's. OK, your legal team, uh, privacy team, uh, you know, all the compliance teams, etc. 
then comes the gap analysis now gap analysis also please understand there are two things if you have done nothing till now there is no point doing a gap analysis you are at zero anyways please start complying from zero as to whatever has to be done but if you are say gdpr compliant okay or you have certain things which have already been done in the organization in this space then please carry out a, a gap analysis and see where you are and where you have to reach the third phase would be implementing those recommendations and again that also we will have to do in a tiered manner chalk out a plan uh, you know and then speak with the relevant stakeholders and then get the uh, you know dotting of i's and crossing of t's and finalization of the that's a quick snapshot pc right i, I think you know uh, you know given the flurry of questions which are coming in i will just take the liberty to extend this session by 5 10 minutes more i think few very good questions which I can sift through. Uh, I will just check uh, one from Vabhav Dalvi from Wellspun. Uh, is there a mechanism to calculate penalty? I hope no, you don't that, come to that, but yeah, but just in case somebody's penalized, yeah. No, but good question. See, there is no mechanism to calculate penalty, but there are certain parameters given, basis which one can reach up to the highest level. For example, the sensitivity of the data breach the date the repetitiveness of the occurrence okay what have you done to mitigate what impact it can have a penalty can have on an organization all these factors would be taken into consideration when you are looking at a penalty quantum right so pretty much like other statutes like how high, uh, have you been bona fide and you know in your conduct yeah but i think you see the good part is that it has been very clearly kind of called out maybe it will get refined further as decisions come through because see it's a principles based approach of law making right so probably uh, some of it would also get guided by the decisions that come in in future the judicial decision by decisions by data protection board and all makes sense uh, the next question is from Sachin uh, Murumkar from John Deere. Does personal data needs to be applicable to Indian citizens or, or residents only? Uh, good question. I think if you look at the applicability part of it, it is stating that if it is a, a personal digital, uh, you know, personal data in digital form, it is covered. Uh, or if it is taken in physical form and then later digitized, that is covered. Also, if it is basically, uh, you know, if some foreign individual is trying to provide any kind of uh, goods or services to people in India, then it is covered. So per se, the parameter which has been mentioned is not there. So if it is otherwise falling in these categories, then it is covered within the purview of law. If it is foreign individual's data, which is getting processed in an outsourcing arrangement, there are some exemptions which we already talked about. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think we can go on and on given uh, the sheer number of questions. but. What we will do, as I mentioned at the outset, we will respond to each of the unanswered questions uh, separately to each of you uh, and also try and weave them into the webinar summary so that others who uh, haven't got the benefit of those questions, they also get to uh, you know hear through pros insights in the webinar summary. With that, I think uh, you know I will request that if we can go to the poll slide, uh, I will uh, ask each of you to respond to the poll slide on your screen to provide feedback on today's webinar. Uh, we take this very seriously as part of our continuous improvement program. So the slide is there for 30 seconds if you can just do the need full. Thank you. I think so. With that, I think we let me just conclude by firstly thanking everyone who participated in this poll. Uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, Shupro team whose presentation was simply outstanding uh, to the point and also our audience for your attention. I hope you found this webinar interesting and the worthwhile investment of your time uh, as manifested by the questions. I think I think it was something you really enjoyed. Uh, we certainly enjoy bringing it to you. Uh, after the webinar, we'll send the presentation, summary, recording, etc. Uh, you will also receive a request for your feedback on the webinar. Please spare a minute uh, to send your feedback, comments, criticism, even compliments. Uh, 
if you are interested in in house training on any other matters uh, or anything else on connected with this webinar uh, please do not hesitate to contact us our contact details would be there at the slide deck at the end of the uh, slide decks thank you for your attendance today and we look forward to being with you again in the in house council forum until then stay safe take care and all the very best thank you